So I'd like to take us back over 100 years, uh, specifically to 1898. 1898 is when, was when Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson was commissioned by the British East Africa Company to build a railway from Mombasa to Uganda. Now, this is a time in history when this was happening all over the world. Steam engines were being created, and it was the first time that, that man, since we had tamed horses, could move faster and more consistently across great distances. It was only a couple days, decades earlier that the Golden Spike was nailed down in Utah that connected both the east and the west coasts of the US. And so it was in this time that Colonel Patterson came to East Africa and he had a specific problem to solve. There's an area called Savo with the Savo River. And like any engineer, especially the pioneering engineers of that day, he had to overcome obstacles as he built this backbone, this railroad, into the insides of Africa, these, these hard to reach places. He had a bigger problem though than most engineers in that the river wasn't his only problem. What the river did was stop his thousands of workers long enough for the lions to take notice and they started grabbing his workers in the middle of the night and pulling them off just outside of the firelight and eating them. That's a hard thing to do, and it's a hard thing to keep working if you see your friends being drug off in the night. Even though they built fires and they slept in tents and they, and they built thorn bomas around where they, where they slept, the lions would leap over them or climb through them and snatch them up. And it got so bad that hundreds of workers started to just leave. So, as a stalwart of empire, our Colonel Patterson, who is only 31 years of age, has to do something. Now, luckily for him, he has a, an ace up his sleeve in that he spent a couple years in India and he was an accomplished tiger hunter. So he sets off and he starts to hunt these lions. It takes him nine months. Finally, in December of 1898, within a three week period, he bags both lions. It was very dangerous. These each were nine feet long. These are massive lines. It took them eight people to carry them back to camp. Now, most people, when they, when they have these kind of obstacles, uh, they're not as visceral, right? Building a bridge, dealing with a mountain, these are the kind of things that most engineers have to solve. When we look at, when we look at, the, at the world, we see that they did this anyway. Right? They overcame these obstacles, and this is a current map of all the railroads around the world. The great challenge of their time was to connect people and places. Right? The great challenge of our time is to connect people and information. So if we take a closer look at Africa's railroads, uh, and we overlay that with a map of the network cables, the internet cables, we can see that they closely mimic each other, they mirror each other. And that's because when you're building a cable, you need access to it. So it's no, it's, it's no great jump to say, you start with a railroad, you build a telegraph pole <coughs> alongside it, that becomes a telephone pole, and soon enough you've got a cable running underneath it. This is what it looks like today. The problem is when you get to the end of the railroad, or when you get too far away from the railroad. Then you have a problem because you now have to deal with things in other countries that look a lot like this. The infrastructure just isn't set up for it. And this is the question that, that kind of got us thinking. We said, why are we using the technology designed for London and Los Angeles when we live in Nairobi or New Delhi? It just doesn't make any sense. So, over here today, I have the most advanced router that money can buy. It's $200, well, not the most advanced you can buy. $200 is the most advanced router you can buy in the local Staples store. And <laughs> it's a really good router, right? You can do a lot of stuff with this. The problem is, it doesn't work here. So, we created the brick. The brick. And it does. So what is this brick? We think of it as this kind of backup generator for the internet. 
what we did is we just took old technology. There's nothing new here. This isn't the, this is the next thing like the first speaker had, right? This is the next old thing. It's got a modem, it's got a router, and it's got batteries inside of it. You can connect it here with a power supply and you can charge it off everything from a car battery uh, to a solar panel. You can, you can manage power spikes, the surges that hit you when you're in, in, in kind of on the edge places. You can plug in an ethernet cable, the founder of the ethernet right here. And when that goes out, as it often does, you have a SIM card slot so you can back up and fail over to 3G. You can charge other things off of it. So you don't just have to deal with charging your, your own phone off of something else. It has an antenna jack so that you can connect an antenna to it, run it up a tree or a building, and extend the range of what you're trying to do. And on the bottom, it has a GPIO spot sensor. This GPIO sensor allows you to connect to all kinds of devices. And, and it gets really interesting when you start connecting things that are well off the grid, machines and people, and start sending that information back to a headquarters somewhere else in the world. Really, we think of what we're doing as extending the rail lines of connectivities to the edges of the network. It's final mile connectivity. So let's take the example that we just heard of, of community health workers in rural Africa. So this is Alex, he lives in Malawi. He's one of the medic mobile guys. Uh, what, what, what you didn't know here about Alex was that he actually has solar panel backpack and with a battery in there. And he makes money by doing his job, by going out there and sending back remote information to headquarters and, and, and helping people in the villages. What you didn't hear was that he also allows other people to charge their phones off of his battery inside of his backpack and he makes extra money. In fact, he makes so much extra money doing this that it easily doubles his monthly income. We imagine a brick inside of his backpack instead where he can also sell that, but he can also sell internet and other connectivity as he goes around these edge of the network places. Remote power stations. This is Husk Power. Uh, also a TED uh, PopTech fellow uh, group back from 2008, and they do remote power in places like India. And what they do is they connect people uh, to power with these little microgrids. The problem is when you start having to do maintenance on these things, you have to send people out to it. Wouldn't it be great to have a sensor that could tell you how things were going before you sent that person out there? Finally, there's uh, just people traveling. This is, this is me a couple years ago, uh, having a little bit of a problem in the middle of the night up in northern Kenya. Uh, I'm gonna be shooting back up there this next week. Why? Because there's a solar eclipse on November 3rd, uh, and the best place to see it is in Lake Turkana. And uh, we're gonna stress test the hell out of the brick. We're gonna go on the edges of the grid. We're gonna see what we can do with this thing. How dust proof is it? Uh, how bounce proof is it? And we're going to try and stream these images back to everybody else around the world. Really, we see two roles with one brick. One is connecting humans, and that's a very easy thing for all of us to understand. But we also think that machines need to talk too. And especially in emerging markets, we need these things to be connected. Because it's harder to do the maintenance. It's harder to do the upkeep. So remember this beautiful system here? This is a, a, a battery backup for this device. And with this modem in my pocket, I could actually get 3G connectivity. And this whole bundle together, minus the brick, would be about $400 uh, here in the US. If I unplug it, it'll stay connected for 69 minutes. When I, when I disconnect this, I have eight hours available. So really what this makes us think is that we're, we're reaching the end of making do with things, with inappropriate technologies in the places that we live, uh, that are designed for other people and other places and other needs. So from today, we'd like to say that this is the end of making do. The brick is made by us, the brick is made for us, and it meets our needs. And coincidentally, it also meets the needs of three billion other people who have the same situation as us. Thank you.